right. Hello everyone, welcome to the May product updates webinar. I know we are in June already, but this is for releases that we did in May. Um, we'll wait for a couple of more minutes for folks to start uh, joining in. Uh, I see about two people per second uh, joining right now. So uh, let's wait for a minute. <clears throat> All right, I think we can get started. Uh, hi everyone, this is Anurag from Price Labs and with me today is David. Uh, David is one of our data scientists who, who worked on one of the major updates that, that we have today. So uh, we thought it would be good if he shares uh, some of the things that he has done. <clears throat> Quickly going over the agenda for today. Uh, one, uh, we want to cover all the new things that have come in. Um, the first one of those is going to be the minimum stay recommendations engine. Uh, we'll give a short demo of where, where would you find this in the product? How do you use it? Uh, and things like that. And then David would go into a few details of how, what data do we use? How actually we, do we come up with these price? Uh, not min stay recommendations. This is something that's new to us, that's new to the industry. Like generally you talk about price recommendations a lot. Uh, minster recommendations is something that that you've done for the first time so like it's important to get a sense of uh, what are we using to get 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 these numbers <clears throat> the next one that we are going to talk about is uh, over time we keep adding a lot of updates to our dynamic pricing uh, solution uh, this could be speed enhancements this could be in terms of new functionality new customizations so just want to give a roundup of the more important ones uh, and then briefly talk about some of the newer integrations that we have as well. Sounds good. <clears throat> so the big one, uh, of course, is minimum stay recommendations. Uh, by now, I'm assuming all of you have seen either the announcement or seen it in product. I just wanted to quickly go over. I'll, I'll share my screen uh, and, and move over to, to Price Labs, my Price Labs account, and then show what that means. <clears throat> but if... Uh, very quickly, to give a little bit of a background, when you come into Price Labs, of course, you know this, uh, you can click review prices and, and see anything like your price recommendations. The customization section is where uh, a lot of the customization possibilities exist. And the stay restriction tab is what we're going to focus on right now. This yellow button is, is what's new. The bell icon uh, in the button is what's new. Other stuff here already existed and so far, we asked you to come up with what should be your default minimum stay setting, what should be your last minute minimum stay setting, whether you want to fill up gaps or not, and things like that. And, and to give you a quick, a quick overview, a lot of you had already had some experience in the market to say, hey, like, yeah, I have, I've always kept my minimum stay at three nights and it gets pretty well booked. And where we came in and said was, what we came in and said was, hey, sure, you want three nights, uh, that's great. But a lot of people, especially booking last minute, tend to book shorter stays. So like if you have open nights, would you consider uh, reducing your minimum stay? And uh, based on your personal preferences, you would go ahead and do uh, set these things up. You could also do things like if, if you have two, three night stays and one or two nights in between, you could create rules to say automatically go fill that gap. Uh, if it is a one night gap, make it a one night minimum. If it's a two night gap, make it a two night minimum and so on. And these settings are pretty flexible as to like, depending on the gap length, what do you want to do? Uh, you could say, I never want one night bookings. Then you could say only do this from two night gaps onwards and things like that. And then on the flip side, there was also this thought that you don't want short bookings or three night bookings eight months out into the future, because uh, by taking that, maybe you're missing out on longer bookings. Uh, so a lot of you would set up uh, minimum stays that are a little higher farther out. Uh, but so far, we have always relied on you to come up with these numbers. Of course, we provided a lot of this information in our market dashboards to say by lead time, 
in your market, what is the minimum length of stay or what, what kind of length of stay patterns exist and things like that. But you had to do all the analysis and come up with what you what kind of settings you want. What's new now, uh, starting about two weeks back, is this button that says, uh, hey, I don't know. Uh, I have looked at some of the data. I have always had a three night minimum. I don't know how much shorter booking demand is there. If Price Labs has all the data, can we recommend these settings? So if you click on that button, what you'll see now is uh, we give two options. Uh, one is prefer, mid, uh, prefer short term stays, and one is for preferring long term stays or mid term stays. For most customers, we recommend uh, short term stays is what you should select. Uh, and, and this is generally speaking, most of the vacation rental industry takes a lot of bookings that are less than 14 nights long. Uh, so what we do here is we look at all the data in your neighborhood that uh, that is for stays that is less than 14 days long and say, okay, <clears throat> based on these booking patterns, what would we recommend? And David is going to go into like, okay, what's the math behind it in some ways. Uh, but we look at that data and come up with these recommendations. So if you see this, you'll see that, okay, we are saying your default should be three nights. We are saying for last minute, within two nights, make it a one night minimum. And within six nights, make it a two night minimum. Uh, we are also saying outside of 30 nights, just make it a five night minimum. There's plenty of longer demand that you should try and attract uh, instead of taking even three night or four night stays. And then there is the orphan night gaps, which sort of supersede everything, which kind of say, if there is a gap, so because your minimum stay for far out is five nights, there might be a four night gap created that becomes unbookable. So we are saying, if there's a gap between one and four nights, go ahead and apply a minimum stay that's same as the length of gap during that period. Now, if I choose the, the midterm one, uh, we are going to now look at all demand, including the longer demand, uh, longer stay demand. And you'll see the minimum night recommendations would be a little higher on that one. Uh, generally speaking, this would be true in cities where we see a lot of midterm demand happening, almost half the bookings we are seeing in some cities that are just like uh, monthly stays sometimes. So we are saying, do this only if you are specifically wanting to target that segment. If, if your thought is to do mixed, we would still recommend staying on the short-term side of things. When you click apply and customize, uh, it's important to note that it's not just apply, it's apply and customize. The thought here is that these recommendations are driven by our data. This is uh, our recommendations without fully considering what your personal preferences are. So for example, you might say, hey, this looks fine, except I don't really want one night stays ever, right? Or I'm okay with one night stays last minute on weekdays, but not really on weekends. What you can do is you can click apply and customize, and then you can say, okay, if it is a weekend, I still want the weekends to be two nights. Uh, and then if there is a gap, I'm fine. Even, even if there is a gap, uh, if it's a one night gap on a weekend, I'm fine with it. If you are not okay with it, then you can actually do a few more things here. You can say, okay, when there's a one night gap, I actually want this to be uh, still two night minimum. I don't want a one night to be booked there. And if there's a gap is a bit low, higher than uh, two nights, then I'm fine with whatever the gap length is. So this way you can really customize. This would mean that on weekends, you would never get a one night booking. But on weekdays, if there's a gap or if it is last minute, then you will get, uh, get those last minute uh, one night bookings as well. Now, this setting is, you will notice that it's available in the listings customizations. Uh, the listings customizations are also available from our multi-calendar. So you will see that if you if you get to the settings from our uh, from our multi calendar, you'll you'll see the same menu. Uh, these list these settings are not available from if you if you manage a, a lot of properties, hundreds of properties, for example, you are not going to see those at an account level or at a group level. So group or account level settings are what we use. A lot of our customers use to sort of manage multiple properties in the same location or similar properties. Uh, what we're saying is, hey, groups can be diverse. We are not going to come up with a recommendation for group, at least right now. We are going to focus these recommendations for each specific property. So you will see this in your listings calendar, or you will see this in your multi-calendar. Uh, multi-calendar is, again, where you can, uh, you can manage a lot of properties together and, and work through those together. So with that note, I wanted to now hand it over to David 
to go over, okay, we have seen how these work, we have seen uh, how these are editable, uh, but how do these work? Like just go, getting into that. Uh, one, one quick thing, uh, as we go through this, if any questions come up, uh, feel free to send those over in the Q&A. It's, it's generally easier for us to manage if they are in the Q&A. Cool. Yeah, um, so I'm David. Um, and yeah, I just wanna <clears throat> go over kind of a big picture overview of how the algorithm works. Um, to give you kind of some intuition on why we're recommending what we recommend. Um, and also then when it's okay and when you kind of should pay more attention and possibly override our recommendations. Um, so let's just kind of first start out with this example. Um, and in this example, right, you have this calendar um, from the 11th to the 20th that is completely open. Every day is available to be booked. Um, and so you don't have any guaranteed revenue right now, um, but there is still potential in the market um, that you'll receive some demand uh, and get some bookings. Um, so if we zoom in kind of on the 14th, and then we see all the four night, or all the possible four night bookings that include the 14th kind of in green below. Um, and currently each one is possible. Um, they will obviously come with a different probability of actually happening of occurrence, um, but they are at least currently all possible. Um, but then let's say something happens. Um, and can we go to the next slide? Let's say you get a booking for the 15th and 16th, um, which is great. You now get guaranteed revenue for the 15th and 16th. Um, and on some level, right, that's, that's just good, right? So you went from only potential revenue to guaranteed revenue for these two nights. Um, but there is a problem. So the problem is that the 14th now, um, we had all those possible four night long bookings before. Um, but three of the four are no longer possible, right? So if someone comes to your site um, and wants to book from the 12th to the 15th, they can't, um, nor could they book from the 14th to the 17th. Um, these are no longer possible, and that intrinsically makes the 14th less likely to get booked. Um, and so we, what we call this is the opportunity cost, right? Um, so you, you took a booking for the 15th and 16th and got the guaranteed revenue for that, um, but there was also the cost of losing some potential revenue uh, on the 14th. Um, and so what our algorithm is trying to do is trying to set a recommendation such that any booking you receive, the guaranteed uh, revenue that you get is greater than the opportunity cost that you lost from having the surrounding dates be slightly less bookable. Um, and this is primarily true for like the directly adjacent dates, like the 14th and 17th in this case, um, but it's also true for the further out dates like the 13th and the 18th. Yeah, cool. I mean, that, that was a great explanation, David. Like, uh, and, and we covered four nights here, uh, but similar to a four night reservation, there are also possible five night reservations, six night reservations, seven night reservations, right? Which, which all significantly uh, reduce in, in possibility of booking. Yeah, very true. Um, so yeah, our algorithm will look at all that data, the booking data in the market um, for your local market for similarly sized listings. Um, so we only look at hopefully your kind of direct competitors. Um, and these graphs will look familiar to those who have kind of checked out our market dashboard product, um, but I'll kind of briefly explain. So the stock graph is showing the number of bookings for a given length of stay um, by stay date for the last year. Um, and kind of as you first look at this, you'll notice that it's a very weekend heavy market, right? There's these orange spikes happening every weekend. Um, and these orange spikes are like two night stays. So on you know, your first look through this, you might conclude, you know, there's this increase in demand for two night stays. You wanna capture this demand. Um, so you, you set your minimum stay for the weekends to two nights. Um, that's great and good, um, but our algorithm is also going to look at the fact that there are these peaks um, slightly lower for these three and four night stays, right? So we see that over the weekends, there are also increase in number of bookings for these three and four night stays. These generate additional revenue. Um, they don't have as big a problem for the opportunity cost. And so the recommendation might very well come back and say, actually, you should set your minimum stay recommendation for three nights or four nights for the weekend. Um, if you select the preferred midterm option, you also notice that there are a significant amount of these longer stays, these 15 plus stays in the market. 
Um, and so if you set your preference to prefer midterm, um, the recommendations might even be higher, right? So you, they're going to try to capture this um, additional or this large amount of these longer stays, um, but it is going to be a slightly riskier strategy, right? So it's higher risk, um, higher reward, um, but it, I that's will... good. Yeah, th that's a great point, David, that it's higher risk and higher reward. I would also say it's higher risk because there are certain kinds of properties that are just more suitable for these midterm stays or longer stays. And also there is uh, not just properties, but also the way you market your property in some ways. Uh, th there, is, there is some segment of the market that primarily focuses on midterm. Um, so unless you're in that segment, unless uh, for most customers, we do recommend sticking to the short term option. And there was a question uh, because we are on this, David. There was a question about uh, sorry. There was a question about what do we consider as short term and what do we consider as midterm? Do you do you want to cover that? Yeah, for us, uh, for this product anyway, short term is any stay that's less than fourteen nights. Um, and midterm is anything greater than 14 nights. Um, and so when you select prefer short term, we are only going to be looking for patterns in the bookings that are less than 14 nights. Um, if you prefer midterm, all, uh, all the bookings are considered. Cool, sounds good. Uh, a few more questions for you, David. Uh, There's a question about uh, whether the algorithm is relevant to uh, only larger cities or small cities as well. Yeah, um, so it should be relevant to all markets um, with the caveat that currently we are recommending a um, just an annual setting. Um, so it will apply evenly across the year. For very seasonal markets, um, you might see that we pop up a warning. Uh, we'll flag certain months that don't really follow our annual recommendation, right? For it, there might be increased demand. Um, so the uh, min state recommendation should be flagged as Increase the, or increase the minimum stay. Um, there might be longer stays happening during that period of the year. Uh, that's another reason it might increase it. Um, it also might say it's low season and there's really no bookings at all and you should take whatever you can get. Um, and therefore it will flag some months as saying you should decrease the minimum stay um, in very seasonal markets. Uh, and we are planning on rolling out some features where we will provide some more guidance on this kind of like seasonal minimum stay. Uh, but right now we, we just have the annual recommendation. Um, there also some the, uh, sorry, I was just saying we have the annual recommendation, but we, if you are in a very seasonal market, at the bottom we'll flag it to say, hey, for these months you should do something different, either increase or decrease. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there are also the fact that uh, minimum stay kind of recommendation should also kind of change based on events and holidays. Um, so in this graph in particular, right, you can see uh, at the end of December 2021 into early January 2022, there is this big peak in about seven night bookings. Um, and that's probably likely due to New Year's, the holidays, um, stuff like that. And so our annual recommendation isn't going to capture the fact that you should probably raise minimum stays for that period of time. Um, and so that's a case where you're going to have to set an override for right now. Um, but we are working again into uh, having some more uh, guidance for those. And I can quickly show where uh, where those overrides would be. So for example, the example David mentioned, you would go in and say, okay, like looks like these dates are in high demand. Let me make my minimum stay seven nights for this period, right? So, so that's uh, that's what David meant by creating an override. There is one other way that, that is possible, which, uh, which would be very useful. And that is about the seasonal settings. So right below the state restrictions where you see uh, the settings button or the recommendation button, you'll see that there is a seasonal and minimum prices tab. Uh, <clears throat> and you can create a seasonal profile. So for example, what I've done in this one is for summer, I've said, okay, starting June 30th to September 7th, which uh, for a lot of beach locations is, is the summer high. I have said, my, I don't need to change any other price settings because Price Labs already takes care of a lot of these. And if you do need to, you can say, okay, during summer, I don't want to sell for below whatever, 500 bucks, let's say. You can select a different minimum stay profile. So like in my account, I have minimum stay profiles for all kinds of things. Uh, and I can come in here and say, for this period, I want a summer profile. 
And then I can come and say, okay, uh, David just mentioned Christmas. So let's do this. Let's have December 15th, or let's say December 20th to, to the 31st be at like, you know, uh, I don't know, let's say longer term means seven nights or something like that. I can do it like that. And then the good thing with, uh, with the profiles is they are also uh, can be set up so that they change over time. So for example, the long-term profile I selected was actually not, not seven nights like, like I'd hoped, but it's actually 31. Let, let, let me change it to seven nights. And I can say, okay, I'm okay holding off of Christmas for a seven night minimum, but if it doesn't get booked and it's a month out, I do want to like lower it to, let's say four nights uh, because I don't want it to be unbooked because I kept trying to get a seven night booking and, and nobody booked. Let's reduce it to four nights when it gets closer in. And if I want to add more levels, I can add more levels as well. So that way for this property for Christmas now, the minimum stay will be seven far out. And then when it gets last minute, it will drop down to four. And this would happen every year. So you don't have to keep configuring it every year. So the seasonal profiles, repeat every year, you'll see that there is no year in, in these dates, uh, which means it's going to apply to 2022, it's going to apply to 2023 and, and so on and so forth. If you need something more specific, for example, then you would go, uh, go and select those specific dates, uh, which is what I had done here. Uh, if I select these dates, these dates do have a specific year attached to it and th those will only apply to 2022, will not apply next year. So if, if it's a holiday that's, if it's a holiday that changes dates around like Easter, or if it's a big event that's coming this year to your town, but it might not happen next year, then you do date overrides. If it's something repeating, you can go ahead and create a seasonal profile for that. And again, those options are available from multi-calendar as well, where you can do multiple listings at once. Uh, and you can do that at, if, if you have many, many listings, you can create groups for listings in a particular location and, and you can do that, that there as well. Sorry, David, that was a long uh, interruption. No, you're good. But yeah, um, so that's roughly how it works, and kind of what it thinks about. Um, and hopefully, you know, like through understanding like minimum stays, you can um, kind of maximize your revenue. Um, you can take these recommendations, you can edit them what you like, or you can keep what you like, edit what you don't like. Um, and you, with minimum state settings, it's mostly something you can kind of set and leave on autopilot. Um, there aren't something you really need to be checking every day. Once you kind of get your setup to the way you like it, um, just kind of review it like maybe on a monthly level um, to make sure everything's still looking okay. Um, but as long as there isn't any problems, it, it isn't something you need to worry too much about on a day-to-day -day level. Yeah, one thing uh, I would recommend is uh, if you see that you're Sorry, before we go any further, there are a couple of questions about whether we are recording this. Uh, yes, we are, and we will send this recording to anybody who registered. Even if you didn't attend, you will get this recording. Uh, we anyways put all our webinar recordings for product updates on our YouTube channel. So even if you're not registered, you're probably listening to it sometime in the future. Uh, cool, sorry, David. Oh, right. Uh, I was going into, uh, like David mentioned that we come up with these uh, every, uh, like we, we update these every month or so. Uh, these are not something that change very often. We are continuously looking to improve these. Uh, but if you do see that, hey, your, your property for whatever reason is beginning to experience a slowdown for what, like a lot of times uh, recently with the, the new uh, search algorithm we have seen on Airbnb, some properties have reduced. You might want to play around with these settings to say, like, hey, let's go ahead and reduce the minimum stay a little bit. Very quickly, there are a few other questions. One is, uh, is, is this at an additional cost? No, it's not. Uh, it's, it's all covered in your subscription. Um, there are two questions that I want to get into. One is uh, about rate plans in booking.com. Uh, so Roger, we don't integrate with booking.com directly yet, but for most of our PMS integrations or channel management integrations, you should be able to map rate plans so that the updates that we send to booking.com, uh, so to, to the PMS, do go to each rate plan in there.
Cool. And then next question, David, um, has this been tested in vacation markets where majority of the bookings are weekends until summertime? Uh, and does the data show improvement in weekday bookings during school year? So I think this would fall into your seasonal markets. So like we know a lot of markets which are very weekend heavy 10 months out of the year. And then when school is out, that's when they become sort of week long markets. So like what would happen in that case? Yeah, in such a case, um, it's probably going to, our recommendations are probably going to prefer the um, longer month out, uh, longer recommendations. Um, and you might be missing out on some of those shorter weekend um, for those specific months, which should be flagged. Um, and it's, you're going to have to probably do some more customization and editing um, right now, uh, but hopefully we'll have a future update where we provide more guidance on this kind of like seasonal stuff. So Vinny, just to uh, uh, answer that in a, with, with my screen showing the recommendations as well, although this, this listing is not in that kind of a market, but we have tested plenty of those markets. What usually would happen, sorry, wrong button. What usually would happen is you would see that uh, your recommendations would say, like, if the demand is very low during weekends, it would possibly say like one or two nights uh, in here. And for weekends, it will say two or three nights. And then last minute, it will say reduce it. And then at the bottom here, uh, I don't have one of those listings there, but I have seen plenty of those. In the bottom, it would say, hey, July and August or June, July, August are uh, like, seem to be a, like, to be on a different pattern, we would recommend increasing your minimum stay for those months. And it's it's not doable from this form right now, but what you would do is again, go back to the seasonal screen and say, hey, let's create a summer season. And then for that, have a different minimum stay patterns uh, that, that sort of overrides your annual settings. Does that answer your question? Uh, Cool. All right. Julian has, or Cyrus has a question on what kind of listings do better on this. I think we, we hinted towards the midterm segment and we said most customers should stay on the short term side of it. And, and probably that's what uh, you're asking about. Uh, what we are trying to say is most properties or most of our customers are on the short term rental side of things. So unless you are in a market where you have uh, restrictions from the HOA or, or, or the municipality uh, stay on the short-term rental side of things. There are some properties or some markets where midterm is all you're allowed to do. Uh, or for your own operational reasons, you only want to do. Uh, you don't want to do like you know, every three days there is a turnover or a cleaning to be scheduled. You're just saying, hey, midterm is what I want to do. And midterm, you have been getting plenty of midterm bookings. Uh, how do I increase the proportion of that? That's when you go to midterm. Uh, if you have not been taking a lot of midterm bookings, uh, we generally would say uh, stick to the short-term rental side of things. Uh, what we don't want to happen is for your property to be a very popular short-term rental property and for you to choose the midterm setting, for example, because you probably want to go that way. Uh, but then because of certain amenities or certain things that uh, that are preferred for midterms, you, you're not getting booked and you have a minimum stay that is high and, and you're not getting the short term either. Cool. All right, looks like I might have answered that one. Cool, great questions, everyone. Um, anything else, any other questions? Let me also look at the Q&A. Oh, there are a bunch of questions on the Q&A uh, as well. Roger, we answered the booking.com one, but it would depend really on, on the property management system. So just to give uh, a, a little higher level overview of this, uh, we connect directly with Airbnb and Verbo, uh, but a lot of our customers, in fact, most of our customers connect to uh, a property management system or a channel manager. So we send prices and minimum stays to the property management system or the channel manager. And then from the property management system, they are sent to Airbnb, to Verbo, to booking.com. If you have a direct booking website hooked up, even there, 
Um, so generally speaking, if uh, for booking.com, you would want to talk to your property management system to say, okay, how do the minimum stay settings that I have in the PMS, how do they translate to different rate plans within booking.com? Uh, Alaria, you have a question about how do you build the profile data? Uh, I think you're asking about if I were to set up the seasonal profiles, how do I select these? Uh, that can be done from, if you go to the dynamic pricing menu and it, if you hit the customizations page. In customizations, we have multiple tabs here. Uh, and what we have been focusing on is the listing level customizations. Um, you can also do group level and, and account level so that uh, you don't have to repeat everything over and over. If you have like hundreds of properties, you don't want to set up five listings that are exactly the same um, individually. You can create a group for those. Uh, right here, you'll see the minimum stay profiles as well. And, and you can create as many profiles as you want. If you want to do like one for Christmas, New Year, one for summer, one for ski season, if you're in a ski market. So you can do those kinds of things. And once you've created those, you come back to these settings and, and you can create profiles there. There is a question about uh, if you have set up a minimum stay in Airbnb, will that be overwritten by Price Labs? The answer is yes. Uh, so when we update our minimum stay settings to Airbnb, they go in as seasonal uh, minimum night settings. Uh, those, if whatever you have in Airbnb will be overwritten by what you have configured here, uh, either by choosing the stay restrictions uh, or on top of that, adding for specific holidays or uh, any, any differences, those will all be uh, overridden by us. There are some rule sets that can be set in Airbnb and, and those rule sets uh, are not overridden. So they, you, you will want to be careful to see, make sure you don't have any rule sets set up that uh, you didn't intend to in some ways. Now, if you do have, uh, and if you want to manage everything from Pfizer, you would want to remove those. Cool. Uh, got it. Uh, right. Uh, I think there is. Uh, Chris, this is already. Uh, if you're asking about the minimum state recommendation feature, it's already there. Uh, so, so you can go ahead into your account, review prices for a property. Uh, click on edit and, and you should see the recommendations here. If you have a new property, um, generally speaking, I don't think you would want to do anything differently. Uh, if you go to a new property, if you get a new property added to Price Labs and it's never been a short-term rental, uh, you, you might want to say, okay, if you have another property in the area and you know a little bit, uh, then you can try to gauge. But generally speaking, I would say, go ahead uh, with these recommendations. Newer properties might, uh, you generally want to, for any new property, and this is advice outside of this particular feature itself. Uh, one of the goals people have is to get to a few good reviews as soon as possible. So you might not, for a new property, you might not get a, like, you know, a seven night booking right away because uh, a seven night booking is sort of a, like for the guest on a completely new property with no reviews is, is a little bit riskier. A, more people might book a one night, two night, three night stay to say like, okay, even if the property is off, it's only a two night booking. Um, so generally speaking, keep it on the lower side and try to get a booking as to start as quickly as possible. So I know folks who, when they do a new property setup, they do uh, in Airbnb, at least you have the new listing discount set up. Make sure the new listing discount doesn't apply to a date that is like, you know, six months from now. You don't want a new listing discount to apply on Christmas and New Year when it's so far out. You want to make sure that the new listing discount applies to uh, a few last minute bookings that come in, stay, and quickly leave a review so that later on when somebody is going to pay the full price for Christmas and New Year's, they see your reviews and they're more likely to book your book, uh, book your stay, uh, book your place for, for that bigger revenue stay. Cool, Zachary has a question about 
sorry david i'm ending up answering all the questions feel free to pitch in whenever you want uh but uh, actually this might be something you take uh, what does uh nights minimum for gaps between x and x mean uh, and i think what zachary is talking about is here so let's let's fill in this form Yeah, David, you want to walk through what these yeah. settings do? Yeah, so I believe it's talking about orphan gaps. Um, so the length of gap setting is going to say, um, say your minimum stay restriction is set to four, um, or in this case, five, right? The default is five, or far out is five. Um, there might be a four night stay or four nights between two bookings um, that isn't currently possible to be booked. This length of gap setting is going to set it so that they, those nights are booked, um, but you have to book the entire gap. So the minimum stay is set to four in this case, because there's a four night gap. Um, if the gap was three, it would be three. If it was set to, if the gap was only two nights, it would be two down to down to one. Um, and this would apply to that um, night's minimum for gaps between X and X. So this is for gaps between one and four. Uh, it's going to have this length of gap setting. If you want it to only be for you know three and four night gaps, you can change that. Um, so now it's only going to be applying for three and four nights. Um, so two nights and one night are still not going to be bookable. Um, and yeah, so you can mess around with that. You know, have it applied to different gap lengths. And yeah, what you creating... can... Sorry, what you can also do is, for example, sorry. You can say, okay, if there is a two night um, gap, I want a two night minimum. But if it's a, a three or four night gap, I can say I just want a three night minimum. Even if there's a four night gap, uh, the chances of all four night booking together might not be high, but I'm okay with three of those nights booking, for example. Uh, when there's a three night gap, I'll say, okay, let's just go with three nights. There's enough three night demand that I'm confident that this might fill in. Uh, two nights, you might say, sure, two nights is good enough. So uh, you can play around with this various uh, combinations and then do different things here. And like I was showing, uh, you can also do this where like you can say when there is a one or two night, uh, a gap between one or two nights long, then you can say, I, I'm okay with my weekday becoming one night because weekdays are, uh, depending on the market, it's uh, it's tough to book. Uh, but if it's a two night uh, gap on a weekend, two night is fine. I never just want to book a one night on a weekend, even if there is a gap that might just mean a party. Uh, so you can say, sure, on weekends, never go down to one on weekdays. I'm okay going down to one. Uh, depending on what you want, you can also define what your weekend means. So for most people in the advanced tab, you will see by default, we do Friday and Saturday as weekends. Uh, there are some customers who say like, I, I want to include Thursday in the weekend as well. So like that's a possibility. All right. Uh, Fanny, how do you change the discount for new listings? I This would be something that you set up in Airbnb. I don't fully know if you can change the new listing discount, uh, but I think you should be able to, uh, but this would be something that you go in Airbnb and do. This is not something that Price Labs control, controls. One of the things we do uh, uh, recommend, if you're a new listing and if you don't want to have that new listing discount uh, apply, because those new listing discounts can be dangerous, right? Like, because it's for the first three bookings, it's not the closest three bookings. If your first booking happens to be for Christmas, and it's a big uh, high season, you don't want to be discounting. What you can do instead of the new listing discount in Price Labs is we have these occupancy-based adjustments and you can pick uh, one of the aggressive profiles for a new listing. What these do is they look at your forward-looking calendar and depending on how occupied you are on a rolling basis in the next 15 days and 16 to 30 days, 31 to 60, depending on how occupied you are, they will adjust your prices up or down. So suppose you have a brand new listing, never taken a booking, the calendar is wide open, you're 0% booked in the next 15 days in 16 to 30 and 31 to 60. Because of that, on top of our recommendations for a normal listing, because you're not booked at all, we will say, hey, in the next 15 days, 
it's so empty. Let's try and give a big discount and see if somebody books. And when somebody books, your occupancy is going to go up. And the next time we update prices, we are not going to have that big discount in there. Instead, the discount will be smaller. And then suppose somebody else books, your discount will slowly disappear. As more and more people book, as you get more bookings, that last minute occupancy based adjustment discount will disappear. Uh, so like for new listings, I know some customers do this as well. They, they pick an aggressive profile and say, my calendar is wide open. Let's try and attract a lot of bookings in the next 15 days by giving a deep discount. Uh, they will come, stay, leave a review, hopefully good review. Uh, and that way for people who are booking two to three weeks from now, they will now see a, book, a listing with, with a few good reviews. Um, uh, Susan has a question about uh, do our minimum stay settings override uh, minimum stays in Airbnb and Verbo? And the answer, Susan, is yes. Uh, if you have this switch turned on, then you are essentially telling us uh, to go in and update minimum stay on your listings. Um, and if you have this turned off, that means we are not going to uh, we are not going to send these settings over to Airbnb and Verbo, and you can manage it directly there. Often gaps, uh, yes. So suppose, um, Fanny, great question. Uh, we, we kind of tend to assume that uh, uh, this terminology we have been using for a long time, but Suppose you have a minimum stay of five nights. You get two bookings that are five night long or seven night long. And then there is one or two days that are sitting alone in between, right? Uh, those gap nights are what we call orphan gaps. And the way we think of it is on those gaps, if it's a one night gap or a two night gap, one, the, the chances of booking those two night gaps are generally low just because on either side, there is no buffer. Like if somebody wanted to book a five night that went over to those two, they can't anymore. And the second thing is generally speaking, if your minimum stay is five nights and you have a two night gap, then it's just not, uh, not just about probability. It's just not possible. Like if your minimum stay is five nights, you are not going to get a two night gap filled. So what we can do is with these orphan rules, we'll automatically lower your minimum stay to where a booking is possible. What some customers also do, so this is, we are talking about minimum stay right now. There is also a orphan day price setting where you can set up a discount to say, I want say a 20% discount uh, for gaps that are less than two nights because you're recognizing that two night gaps are harder to book. Some customers also do this where they say, you know what? I don't want one night bookings at all. I want to bump up the price by 50% when there is a one night booking. And then I'm okay taking that one night booking when there is a gap. So you, you can play around with often gaps and, and they can be a very good source of additional revenue. Like dates that you thought can't be booked now suddenly uh, can be booked. David, I think your keyboard is making a lot of noise. Cool. Great questions, everyone. Uh, David, I have a few more questions uh, coming up. Sorry, I'm, uh, there's a long question we are just reading through. All right. Um, there was a question about uh, not necessarily about minimum stays. Uh, it was more about dynamic pricing itself and how if if your calendar is not getting enough bookings, uh, if you go to help me choose a base price, you would generally see that we are probably re re recommending reducing the base price. But sometimes you might say, hey, I just want to reduce the base price for the next few days or next few weeks or next few months. Uh, generally speaking, if, if that's the intent, if you don't want to change your prices far out, if you only want to keep them, give a discount 
to get something in here. One, I, I already talked about the occupancy based adjustments. You can also select dates here and say, okay, let's let's drop the prices by 10%. That that can be done. You can also, if you want, you can drop the base rate, but you can then say, I want uh, let let me set a minimum price for far out bookings. Like I don't want to book more than six months out at a cheap rate. So I can say uh, my minimum rate usually is 150, but if it is outside of 180 days, I, I really don't want to sell anything below 200 on weekdays and 250 on weekends. Uh, so that way you can play around a little bit with your base price uh, and then impact prices close in, but hopefully not go too far down uh, for far out, far out dates. You can also set a far out premium. Uh, we, we already talked about occupancy based adjustments, but you can also in here, for example, I can say if it's more than 180 days out, just go ahead and like, depending on occupancy, you can say like, yeah, bump up the prices by 10% overall. And then you can do those kinds of things. All right, uh, we'll come back to questions, uh, but I think we are about 14 minutes from, from ending the webinar or at least the slotted time we had for it. So I did want to cover a little bit of some of the other updates that have gone in. Uh, and these will again touch upon some other things we have already seen actually. So one is uh, we talked about orphan night discounts. One of the common requests we were getting from a lot of customers is because when there's a two night gap, you want to reduce your prices to, to try and get a booking. Uh, but you may not want to do it for weekends. Uh, so now you'll see this checkbox that by default is checked. It means if there's a two night gap, we are going to reduce the discount by uh, the price by 20%. But if you uncheck it, the weekends will now stay as they are. It's kind of saying, hey, the weekends, it's, it's useful for a lot of city markets or a lot of markets which are weekend heavy. Uh, I guess I've almost covered every market at this point, but uh, where you know that there's plenty of weekend demand that you don't need to discount even the, if, though there is a gap. This is what when David was showing that uh, the demand chart where there were a ton of two night oranges that you saw, you, you can say there's plenty that I don't need to discount it, um, discount the price. The second one is very important for uh, some of our larger customers who use group or account level settings uh, very often. So you'll, you'll see this, this property in my account is assigned to the group villas. And if I go to this group, uh, you will notice <clears throat> that I have, I don't have any settings set up as such, but on the group calendar, I have said for the 16th till 18th, I want a three night minimum. And any properties that belong to this villas group, uh, there might be 20, 30, 50, all properties get that three night minimum just because at a group level, I said, I want this. So I don't have to go to, uh, you know, 50 calendars and say uh, for this weekend, I want a three night minimum. I can just do it at a group level. What we added now is the possibility for you to be able to see when you're reviewing this calendar, you might wonder like, okay, last minute, my settings don't usually say one, 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 they, they, they should have been two. Why do I have three here? we added an indicator here to say, hey, there is some group level or account level override that's causing this. So by default, this setting is turned off. So like there is a switch here. If I turn it off, those indications go away. But uh, for, for some of our larger customers, it might be useful to turn it on to be able to see what dates have an override that you, you need to be mindful of essentially. And then the last one is about pagination on review prices page. Um, so this is again, something useful for a lot of our very large customers. So I have three listings loaded up in, in my calendar right now, but if I had like hundreds of listings, for example, uh, usually we would load all like 200, 300, 500, however many listings are there on this one page. Uh, that would sometimes slow the page down. So you would have to very, be very careful with choosing what filters you use. What we have done now is we load 10 pages here. So even though there are 342 listings in this account, you see the first 10, you can still sort them by all kinds of things. So like, I want to see all the listings that are uh, doing well first, I can do that. And it works across pages. 
I can search across pages. So just because something is not on the front page, it might be on the 25th page. I can still search for it uh, and it shows up. So it just improves how you work in Price Labs and then speeds those things up. And then the last one that's, uh, that we already went over is uh, we also improved our seasonal settings. Uh, so, so if you see here, earlier our seasonal settings, uh, the UI was a little cumbersome. So we have uh, streamlined this a lot to make sure that you're able to add uh, specific seasons or needs for specific holidays much more easily than, you know, uh, Earlier, you would require you for doing this, you would have to create five seasons, which was unrealistic. Uh, now you can do it in a, in a much more uh, streamlined way. All right, uh, we've covered a lot of QA as we went, but I think we have about nine more minutes, David. Any questions that uh, jumped out? Uh, so there's a few questions, I think, concerning the, the Orphanite discounts. Um, do these discounts show up to the prospective guests um, that it would be this price, but then it's this discounted price? Generally speaking, no. So it depends on how the OTAs come up with that strike through price. Um, one way that we know uh, the OT has come up with a strike through price is, for example, in Airbnb, if you set a special discount for certain dates or set up a weekly discount or set up a new listing discount, those show up as strike through price. We also know that on some OTAs, uh, and this is becoming a little more common, when the price, even though you have not set up a discount in the OTA, because the price dropped, the OTA will say, hey, it used to be 100 bucks, now it's 80 bucks, so there is a discount. Um, so the answer isn't super clear. I know there is, uh, depending on regulations, that OTAs are also like, uh, have to be careful about when they can show a strike through price. But generally speaking, uh, what we have seen so far is it would not show up as a special price. Uh, it would just, just that the price would be lower. Uh, Fanny, I think you have a question about if you change a price on Price Labs, do you have to change it on Airbnb? Uh, the answer to that one is no. Uh, as long as you have the sync switch here turned on, uh, you will see that we go in every day and update the prices for your properties. Uh, if you make a change, suppose you make, uh, suppose you select these three dates and you say, hey, I want the price to be 300 bucks here, like nothing else. You can click on sync now and we will queue it up so that the update goes through within five minutes. Uh, and if you if you go back and see, it will show you here that it was last synced. Like if you come in five minutes, it will say last synced a few minutes ago and last refreshed a few minutes ago as well. Any other questions to it? Um, not that I'm currently seeing. In uh, chat, I see another question from Cyrus. Uh, does the sync also apply to Verbo? And the answer, Cyrus, is yes. What you would have to do is if you haven't, if you just have your Airbnb property in Price Labs then you would also want to add your verbal property. If you use a property management system or a channel manager, then you should not do either of them. You should just pick whichever property management system you use and, and import via that. But if you don't use any of those, then you import either Airbnb and both Airbnb and Verbo. That way you will see two listings here what you would then want to do, and, and this is covered uh, when you onboard in our training webinars, I would highly recommend everybody to take those if, if you haven't. But what you would then want to do is go to the manage listings page and really map those two listings together. So you can tell us that, hey, this Airbnb listing and this Verbo listing are actually the same listing. Uh, what they would look like at the end of it is this. They would essentially say, these three listings are actually the same listing. And 
it will help in two ways. One is instead of charging you for two listings, which is for US and Europe, it's uh, $34.99. We would charge you as one child and one parent, which is $20.99, so like significantly cheaper. But then also, anytime you make changes to the parent, we will automatically copy that to the child listing. There is always a checkbox that is by default switched on. That way, if you want to make your minimum stay for Christmas to be seven nights, you do it on one, we copy it to the other one, and then we send it over to both uh, whenever we sync the prices next. Uh, so you're not having to manage you know, two calendars. Th those two listings will stay in sync. So there's another question. Uh, changeover days are not part of orphan days, right? Or are they? Change over days. Uh, so let me try and unpack the question a little bit. So change over days are usually, at least the way I'm thinking of, is somebody is checking out on Tuesday and somebody else is checking in on Tuesday evening. So somebody's checking out on Tuesday morning, somebody else is checking in on uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, and Tuesday would be called the changeover day because that's when who is staying is changing, essentially. That will not be called an orphan day. Uh, that uh, Because there is no night involved, uh, <clears throat> nobody can book like you know the afternoon in, in some ways. Um, if somebody was checking out on Tuesday morning and somebody else was checking in on Wednesday evening, now your Tuesday night is a one night that can be booked. That would be called an orphan night. Uh, and if your minimum stay for that Tuesday is two, nobody can book it. You won't show up in search results. But uh, if you configure Price Labs uh, to accommodate one night stays on weekdays, we will, the next time we update, which is every day, we will see, hey, you have two bookings and a one night gap. You told us that you're okay with a one night booking on a weekend. Let's make it a one night minimum for that Tuesday. So if somebody searches, they will uh, uh, they will see it in their, like, in the results and potentially you get a booking. Sounds good. Peyton is asking if there is a <clears throat> master key that outlines uh, what Price Labs updates and what uh, what should be updated in Airbnb. It should be covered in our help article. Uh, so if you uh, if you if you've never used the help uh, help desk, I would highly recommend clicking on that small question mark, orange question mark at the bottom right. You will see that there is a search menu. So I'll, I'll go to that very quickly. But before I get there, I did want to say, if you haven't already done this, I highly encourage taking one of these, actually two of these training webinars. So we have Price Labs 101 and Price Labs 201. Uh, and we also have recordings. So like if you can't make it to a certain time, you can, you can always do that. Um, you can register on our webpage where uh, pricelabs.co slash training. Uh, and we conduct this every day uh, of the week. Uh, yeah, like at least once a week. Uh, once a day, every day. Uh, 201s are a little less frequent. They are done once a week uh, in different languages, but 101s are every day. Highly recommend taking those. Uh, but if uh, to get back to the point, like if you search for Airbnb, it will show up how to integrate price labs with Airbnb. And this article should cover like what do we, what do you set in price labs? What do you set in, uh, in Airbnb directly? Generally speaking, uh, and this also does cover, like if you're using both Airbnb and Verbo, like how do you do this? Should smart pricing be on or off? Uh, and, and all kinds of answers, right? Like, so uh, I, if you're using price labs with Airbnb, I highly recommend looking at this. Generally speaking, the prices, minimum stays, check-in restrictions is what you set up in price labs. Everything else should be controlled in Airbnb.
All right, Cyrus has one more question, David, uh, that is important, uh, cleaning fees. Um, so how do you set a cleaning fee uh, and whether we can add something in Trice Labs to do it? Uh, at least, got it. At least right now, uh, we don't control the cleaning fees in any of our integrations. Actually, uh, cleaning fee is generally a property level setting that that you set once and it applies to all dates. Uh, so we haven't started doing it yet. It, it can be something that we look into. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a firm answer on this. Peyton, I'm, I, I'm reading your question about the minimum floor and maximum price ceiling. I don't fully understand how it relates to cleaning fee. If you can send an example to our support desk and uh, mention that it's a like follow-up question from the webinar, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to answer that. Cool, thank you, Peyton. Like if, if you can uh, yeah, provide a little more color to it on, on email uh, to our support team. Uh, they'll tag us. And yes, like we said, uh, we will. We have been recording this. Uh, we will put it up on YouTube. And if you have registered, you will get an email about it. And even if you didn't register, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel and see it. Usually, we upload it within a couple of days of uh, of recording the webinar. Cool. David, any closing thoughts? Um, I know we're very excited to kind of get this new feature. Um, any feedback you guys have on it? Do the recommendations look good? Do they look bad? Um, yeah, feel free to kind of reach out and tickets to our support if you have any like questions or feedback. Um, would really appreciate it. Perfect. And then, yeah, any feedback about the recommendations? We are constantly looking to improve and evaluate any feedback about the workflow itself. Um, and we have spoken a lot here uh, and we picked the graphics we picked were all from our help article. So if you haven't seen, seen it yet, uh, I would recommend if you want to um, for an afternoon reading, we have a fairly detailed written explanation of how this works. This is more or less what David had covered uh, in, in his section. So uh, do give a read through it. It covers a lot of important things. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Uh, I know like an hour of, uh, of, of listening to this is uh, taking out time from your busy uh, day is not easy, especially on a Monday. So thank you everyone, yeah. Right. That. Bye, David. Bye.